The New York City chapter of the Historical Novel Society is pleased to present this recording from December 7, 2022. On this day that will live in infamy, we present Closer Than You Think, The Echoing Trauma of World War II. Our panelists are Eve Carlin and Martha Ann Toll. Our host is Steering Committee member Stephanie Cowell. Information about our chapter and its leadership is available at our website, link listed in the comments. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Hello, it's lovely to see you all in this beautiful room. <clears throat> and thank you for coming to this um, program of the New York City branch of the Historical Novel Society. And I'd like to introduce our authors today, Martha Ann Toll, author of Three Muses, and Eve Carlin, track 61. And I want to thank them for traveling in from Pittsburgh and East Hampton to be with us today. So many years ago, uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons this program of novelists who write about World War II interested me. Um, many years ago, I met an older man, uh, somehow tremulous in the way he presented himself and the way he moved. And when he unbuttoned his shirt and his shirt rose up his arm, I saw the tattooed numbers on his aging skin, um, a whole story was before me. This war that happened before I was born and has never really left us. It's a long time since the war ended. And when I read moving novels of it, such as these, I see the streets. I almost don't dare to look out my own window sometimes when I'm immersed in a novel for fear of what I will I will see there, their novels are so real to me. So there are endless takes on the recreation of that inconceivable war begun by a power hungry madman who put himself up to be the savior of the German people. The nonfiction and the novels comes from the gifts of so many writers. So to begin, um, I'd like to ask you both to introduce yourselves and um, your novels and uh, tell us something about them. Martha, would you start? Sure. Okay. And that's close enough? Okay. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to <laughs> Faith and Stephanie and Susan and Gordon. Um, my name is Martha Ann Toll and my book is Three Muses. And the premise of Three Muses is that um, it's nominally a love story between um, a Holocaust survivor whose childhood name was Yanko and his adult name is John, and a ballerina whose childhood name was Catherine and her adult given name for the stage is Katya. And um, they meet in improbable circumstances and John does not know that um, Katya is in a difficult, abusive creative partnership with her choreographer whose name is Boris Yanakov. And the three muses of the title come from um, a Boeotian branch of Greek mythology, and that is um, they are song, memory, and discipline. And we can talk more about that as we go on. I'm sorry, may I add one more thing? Of course. <laughs> Before we go on, I just interrupted myself. No. Um, Yanko survives the war. He is, he is a Jewish boy and his family is taken to a concentration camp and he survived the war because his mother tells the SS officer when they're in line for the gas chamber that he can sing. So he's pulled out of line to sing for the commandant who is responsible for murdering his family. And I must must add, if I might, that it's I was rereading as much of the novels as I could uh, in the last few days. I'd read them, of course, before, and those scenes are absolutely harrowing. This frightened um, little boy, not knowing what, where, how, where his mother is, anything. She really had the mind of a very, very frightened child, and also many, many memorable scenes. From Eve, could you tell us about your novel? Sure. Um, my <laughs> Well, I'm a bookseller, first and foremost, in East Hampton, New York, and I um, started writing my novel. It's um, based on a historical event that happened 80 years ago this past June 13th. Um, four Nazi saboteurs 
came ashore in Amagansett, New York, virtually in front of the home where I grew up years later, but in front of that house. And basically, um, many people seem to know about that story that the men came and they landed, but few people seem to know what happened to these guys. Um, and it was just a very interesting story to me. And as I delved into it, I saw the story from a different perspective than what I had anticipated when I set out to write the book. So basically it is a World War II story, but it's a World War II story set on American soil, which, um, well, yours is to a great extent, Yeah. but um, it's about the sabotage <laughs> mission, Operation Pistorius. I'd like to say it's a, it's a fascinating technique. She uses, we know who Greta, the young, um, the young girl who has come from Germany to live under the protection um, of her of her uncle, but we 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 know her from the beginning. We, uh, but we don't know who the four uh, saboteurs are really. Are they on our side? Are they on the German side? I mean, you don't really know uh, to the end, which is rather astonishing to me. And can I ask you um, it, it, to tell everybody what is? Track 61. Okay, so um, many people believe that, um, <clears throat> well, they were saboteurs sent here to destroy um, ammunition um, factories. Um, track 61 is, as some of you might know, is a private rail line that goes underground Central Station that still exists to this day. It's very near a place also un in Grand Central underneath. Um, called M42, which housed rotary converters back in the 30s and 40s during the war. And many people do believe that um, the target for the saboteurs, among other things, was M42. And had they um, succeeded in destroying the rotary converters there, then the rail lines up and down the East Coast would have been stopped. There wouldn't have been troop transports. Um, and also the power there supplied um, munition factories, and which built which um, built aluminum plants or supplied aluminum that built airplanes. So had that not had those aluminum baths frozen, it really would have set the U.S. war effort back tremendously. So track 61 is the rail track that many people believe well. In fact, FDR used when he came to New York, it was a private rail track. And also in my book, I incorporate as being part of the mission of the saboteurs. Well, is it, did I read somewhere that there's a, a private tour you can take to go down and see that? Um, I have, yeah, like the Bowery Boys or something. Or some, did you yes, go down there? I was not privileged enough, oh, but no. you can see lots of very cool photos of, of the track and there is still a door on the side of the wall oh, wow. that supposedly leads down there so in, in, in under our grand central station 10 stories down that, oh my 10 stories down m42 is the deepest even to this day sub basement in new york city it's really amazing to think that four men if they had had been able to do it had could have done such damage when there were hundreds of thousands on the mm -hmm. battlefields in europe and here there were four it's just it's just four guys walking around and of course Greta who's terribly innocent has no idea who anybody is if they're good if they're bad what are they doing here she's a very very innocent innocent point of view <clears throat> which brings me to wonderful the sense of place which I think you both have such such a great way you've brought it particularly alive um my mother was a young woman just come to New York City during the war years and I've always been fascinated by pictures and writing of that time, the look and smell of the subway, the people, the crowds, and you both recreate it so beautifully. Um, can you tell me how you went about creating such places and people that I lost my own world when I was reading your books? How did you do it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my own dad was a World War II vet, and while he was alive, I did get a lot of information from him, for example, what the troop ships were like. Um, the troop ships 
were converted immediately after the war to transport refugees and also American soldiers going back to work on the Marshall Plan. Um, I always want to say this in front of um, a historical novel audience. One of the things I had to do was jettison some history in order to keep it accurate. Mm -hmm. So I um, had the memoir of my mother's cousin who lost her family in Auschwitz, but she and their grandmother made it over in 1937. And she wrote a beautiful memoir just for the family about growing up in Mainz, Germany, that was with photographs, that was extremely graphic. I mean, she's a really good writer. I mean, English was her second language, obviously. And um, she, she really transmitted what we know about, particularly about Hitler's Germany, that German Jews were um, extremely assimilated. And many of them said, you know, I never knew I was Jewish until Hitler came to power. So she came from that kind of family. Um, I also knew other Holocaust survivors growing up. And as Stephanie referenced, you know, we would have relatives that would come to Thanksgiving with tattoos on their wrists. Um, and I, as I got older, I really, really needed to know these stories. They're extremely compelling. And every story, including the one you just told, is, is its own story. And they're all remarkable. Um, the things I had to get rid of because I got so hung up on it. One was I wanted to set part of uh, that my protagonist, John, gets to the United States. He trains to be a psychiatrist, and I have a lot that was set in Bellevue Hospital. And then I went down a rabbit hole, like, what did the floor look like in 1956? <laughs> you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't establish it. So I fictionalized it because I thought somebody's going to come along and remember it's Bellevue Hospital. And it's going to really bother them. Um, similarly, um, the protagonist is a ballerina. She dances with a fictional company in New York. And um, the first couple of years of drafting, I had her centered around the Swan Lake Ballet, which everybody who goes to ballet is very familiar with, including myself. But um, I didn't think I could learn it well enough. And my writer hat was, it's not in service of the story. It's not the right story. So I jettisoned all existing ballets. All the ballets in the book are fiction. I created them. I chose the music for them. And um, it was very freeing. I mean, it was a lot of work then to figure out how to get them on the page. But I had to do those two things in order to, to make it more historically accurate on some level. That's really interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening. I know I write things and, and my goodness, I think something's going to be terribly important. And I, I read three books on it and it ends up in half a line in the book. And it's, I, I know you all relate to that and you say, oh my gosh, you see the books on your shelves later and, and it's like, goodness. What was I thinking? I mean, I have one paradigm story about this, which is I'm a trained musician. I'm a viola player. And a string quartet, which is a very common um, genre in classical music, is made up of two violins, a viola and a cello. And I once opened a book by a really famous novelist that where the main character is a cellist. And there's a string quartet on page one that's a bass player, a violinist, a violist, and a cellist. And I, it took me right out of the narrative. I was like, that's, th oh that's what I was worried about. <laughs> uh, I always worry about those things. It's somewhere in, in all my books, there's something that I go, oh no, hope no one notices that. So sense of, sense of place. Eve. Well, I certainly grew on your doorstep. Yes, <laughs> I grew up knowing that these four men, a U-boat, <laughs> had literally just you know floated and deposited these men, you know, um, I don't know, a hundred yards, two hundred yards out in the ocean. And I grew up in this house with my grandmother, among other people. My grandmother was um, a German Jewish refugee. <laughs> And the irony that she had watched my sister and I there on that beach on the very same sand, stretch of sand where the Nazis had landed, struck me as being very significant. Huh? So um, I chose to see the saboteur story, which I certainly researched by reading um, the military trial transcript, um, as well as many, many articles. Um, that are also somewhat fictionalized in the Times and other places, according to J. Edgar Hoover's interpretation of events. <laughs> but um, I read all that and I saw these events through the eyes 
of my grandmother who died last year at 101. Oh, bless her. Um, and she also shared with me and us, my family here, many, many stories about her childhood, about coming from Monheim, um, about just how hard it was as a very popular outgoing young woman to, to be the other in a new country. And, and that really struck me. Wow. So now I have to ask, well, I must mention Sense of Place, that I, I particularly loved the Automat. Uh, oh, yes. Because I was, a, I, was a, I, I was, in fact, that's true. They did have a meeting at the Automat. They did. As much as possible is absolutely true. Yeah, they did meet there. Well, it was before my time. Otherwise, I'd say <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't there eating my five cent um, salami on rye, which you get in the little. Anyone here ever been to the Automat, the old Automat? Yes, yeah. take us off. Oh, I just loved it. My mother wanted me to take me to fancy restaurants, and I wanted to go to the Automat, and she was appalled. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me. I look at all my friends and I say, because all my friends, you know, they, they all write such different things. And I look at them saying, what? You did what? You know, so why did you write this particular story? Um, well, I guess <clears throat> I'm still trying to figure that out. I know <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a very, very secular Jewish family and I'm quite certain that the Holocaust was my introduction to Judaism. And it, it was horrifying. I mean, I can remember boys talking about it at school when I was five and six years old. Or, you know, they used to turn Jews into soap bars, and you, it was in the atmosphere. And, you know, as I look back, it's a blink of an eye. I mean, it occurred, the Holocaust occurred so shortly before um, I was born. And I got really, really interested. So I, it's been with me a long time. I've been reading about it since I could read, basically. Um, and I also love ballet. I'm not 100% sure how they came together, but yeah. I had the two characters. Um, I always had those two, those two main characters early on, they came to me. And then when I discovered this myth of the three muses, I felt like that can frame the book, that, that idea of those three song, discipline and memory. Well, for me, I actually, um, I read an earlier book about a well on Spring Street. I'm not sure if any of you know that there's a, a well that was built who, in the 1790s um, on Spring Street that you can still see today, 129, where a young woman was murdered. Um, so that was a, my first book. She was murdered there, and the men that defended the man accused of the murder were Hamilton and Burr working together on the first recorded murder case in US history. Wow. So I happened to live across the street from that well. Um, and I did not know that because at the time the well was in the basement of the Manhattan Bistro, a, a restaurant that was there for 40 years. I didn't know that until I read Ron Chernow's amazing book on Hamilton. Then I, um, I was like, oh my goodness, I snuck down and I looked at the well and this bizarre restaurant, my husband came with me. <laughs> and I really feel that it taught me that history is underfoot. Oh, literally. In this <laughs> literally. building, in Grand Central, everywhere we go. So after having had that experience, I also I sought another New York City story that resonated as deeply with <laughs> me. And I found that in the men that came ashore where I used to mm -hmm. swim and sunbathe. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, and can you can you both tell me I'm, I always want to know because the current book that I'm going to be publishing in six months was written between the other books, under the other books, behind the other books. Anyway, it took a long, long time to finally bring this book forward. So how long did you each since you first had the idea? How long did it take you to? <clears throat> um, well, I started writing in 2010, and it was accepted for publication in 2020. So it took a really long time, yeah. and it went through a lot, a lot of versions. I always say that in the passive voice, by me. You know, or it was like somebody was doing that. I guess it was me. I mean, it went through a lot of iterations, but it took 10 years. Would it be like barely recognizable now? If you no, were? it was pretty recognizable. <clears throat> I had a lot of issues with myself about order, the order I received 
advice early on, editorial advice early on to tell the story chronologically. And it took me about five years to get rid of that because I think when we talk together, when we first meet somebody, we don't get a chronological right. story. We we get random facts and then we sort of put, you know, put a composite together. So that was one thing. And then, as I said, I, I spent years and years on things that I didn't end up using, which I bet everybody in this room has had that experience. For example, Swan Lake, you know, the 50 times I watched the video and then didn't use it. And, and there was lots of other stuff that, that ended up on the cutting room floor. Well, I, I always give this disclaimer that I have triplets, but as I get older, it, it becomes less and less of a good excuse. Um, I would say, you know, writing is a process, and it, you just have to trust the process, I think, hmm. for people who to need to put themselves out there and just trust that you will return to it. If, it. if the story is important to you, it's good to step away, to go back, but just to answer the question, I would say about mm, five years, six years, all said and done. Um, well, you wrote about impressionists. I always wonder, like, at what point do you put that last brush stroke in? At what point do you turn away from your book and say, okay, now perhaps it's ready to see the world? It's a, it's a, it's a tough call to make, but at some point you have to make that call. It's a tough call to make. I was reading recently, <clears throat> I forget where, that, that as you, as you go on in your writing, you're going on in your life and, and things happen to you and, you're, and you've, you're writing this book and because of the things happening to you, you know, a loss of love, the birth of a child or death of somebody, the book changes slightly. And even looking at my own work now, which is going to be published in six months, I say, I should have done that differently. Yeah. And because I am, I am a different person, I think maybe that's why in publishing they don't let you change after a while because they know you would do it you know i feel like getting on my knees please just page 146 that one way you know no <laughs> they know us so i know you've done a little bit about this but can you tell me something about yourselves and you know where you well you told me a little bit about where you grew up and and how did you how did you become a writer um, well, there are a lot of different answers to that. Um, I would say first, I grew up in suburban Philadelphia and writing was in the water supply in my house. My mother was, <laughs> um, my mother was a professional copy editor and editor and my dad was a lawyer, but a really spectacular writer. And he was extremely interested in writing. Both my parents are really interested in the written word with the dictionary at the mm -hmm. table. And they, I asked for their help as I was growing up, they would look at my papers and they, I never got a compliment. It was like red, uh -huh. red, you know, all over the place. So, but actually I, um, it, I started as a young child in ballet. I didn't, was, didn't have the body for it. And then I did a very, very deep dive into music. And somewhere in the middle of college, I realized I, I'm going to go to law school because words are my life and it, it's just, who I am. So I had a career, a short career as a lawyer and a very long career in social justice, running a charitable foundation that worked on anti-death penalty work, wow. homelessness, very writing intensive jobs. But I didn't start writing, and I was always a maniac reader from earliest days. So I, I, my mom died pretty suddenly in 1999 and the floodgates opened, that's all I can say. I just started <laughs> writing fiction and it hasn't stopped. So some of yeah. it is a little woo woo, and I can't really explain it. <laughs> and some of it is just how I was raised. I, I think it's actually a lot of woo woo for a lot of us. You can't yeah. really, really say utterly because it's a kind of a mystic thing that that just sort of starts to grow. It's it's wonderful. And um, I worked in publishing. <laughs> I worked at Random House in marketing for many years. So I mean, I was always a reader. And um, when you work enough in publishing and read enough, you kind of like to think, well, I could do not all of this. Believe me, there's some writers out there that are amazing. But, you know, you can try. And then you can try and you can learn and you can learn. So that's pretty much my process. Um, I just read a ton. I now work in a bookstore. I'm exposed to a lot of writers. And it's really interesting because I think no matter what level they are, there's a common thread um insecurity is this <laughs> that so it's um it's it's you know it's a process and i mean i just love it 
I love to read. I love to read your, all your works. And yeah. I just like to, I love the research too. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Well, since we've heard so much about your writing, would you both mind reading a few minutes from sure. your books? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to read um, the <clears throat> scene. It's early in the book. Um, where Yanko is in line with his mother, um, as, as I just described. This is 1944. Muti jumped off the train holding little Max. She landed a meter away, her skin showing through the elbows of her coat, a remaining button hanging by a thread. In place of air, a smoky stench. In place of sound, shouting soldiers. The ground was scuffed with ice. Muti, Max, and Yanko clustered with the women and children. Men were ordered into single file next to them, even Herr Professor Goldstein, who taught at gymnasium, and Herr Dr. Kornblum, who used to grind eyeglasses. Yanko tilted toward Max and tried his regular tricks. He stuck out his tongue and crossed his eyes. Max didn't giggle. He ogled Yanko through tears. An SS man pushed through the women and children and thrust his thumb at Yanko. Into the men's line. He's 10, Muti said. Yanko opened his mouth to correct her. Actually, he was 11. But Muti didn't notice she was glaring at the SS man. He's only 10, Muti said again. The soldier jabbed the butt of his rifle in the small of Yanko's back and began angling him away. Muti raised her voice. He can sing. With her free hand, the one that wasn't holding Max, she gripped Yanko's sh shoulder and called him by his German name. Johan, sing for the officer. The first thing Yanko thought of was the four questions from Passover, Manish Tana. Why is this night different from all other nights? Papa had rehearsed them with Yanko, stern and man to man, even though Yanko was hardly old enough to sit through Seder. Singing and memory are members of the same family, Papa said. We are a people scattered around the world. Songs help us to contain our common memories. Yanko! Muti's whisper sounded impatient. Sing something different. Yanko tried to recall the songs from the schoolyard where he went before he wasn't allowed to, before Aunt Ella's dress shop had the windows kicked in and everything stolen from inside, before Herr Goldman jumped out the window when the synagogues were whole, when Papa... Yanko looked at Muti again. He fixed his gaze beyond the slate sky and cupped Max's head against Muti's breast. Nothing came to him. Muti leaned over, Max squirming in her arms, and hummed in Yanko's ear. Get away from him! But Yanko had heard something. Muti had unleashed a, unloosed a song. Yanko opened his mouth. For der Kassern, for dem Grossen Tor. Melody, soothing and relaxed, thawed the cold. Stande eine Lantern und steht sie noch davor. The tune as familiar as breathing. Everybody knew the lantern by the barracks gate where Lily Marlene's soldier last kissed her. The SS man put down his rifle and dropped his shoulders. Women around Muti and Max shifted their gaze from the front of the line to Yanko. Men stopped muttering and shuffling and faced the singing. For the briefest moment, it felt less lonely. The SS man poked Yanko's shoulder. Come. Yanko looked at Muti. She pressed her lips to his forehead, warm against his skin. Her eyes were closed. The SS man shoved Yanko through the line of women and children. Yanko tried not to stumble as he was prodded along the frozen ground. Once, he twisted around. He could see Muti, but he couldn't get her attention. She was staring in front of her, advancing in her line, clutching Max to her bosom. Oh, beautiful. Can you read us something? Sure, uh, I'll Thank also. Yes. Um, I'll just read from the beginning as well, which is rather entirely different. Um, this is June 13th, 1942, um, off the beach in Amagansett. Peter sought solace in the pitch black, black sky. The shore was shrouded in fog and his eyelashes were moist with sea spray, or was it tears? He had endured 17 months in prison and 17 days at sea, only to have landed on a desolate beach with three misfits, none of whom could be trusted. 
50 yards past the breakers, a long, dark object lurked just below the ocean's surface. If he didn't know better, he might have thought it was a whale. The hull scraped sandy sea bottom and gravel washed against iron. There was a loud swish he recognized as the sound of the submarine blowing water from its tanks as it tried to lift itself off the ocean floor. The surf pounded like a war drum, urging him to run, while his feet sank into the wet sand, cementing him in place. George stood beside him, frantically searching his pockets. Damn it, Pete, I lost something. The silver streak in his hair glistened with salty mist as he dropped <clears throat> hands and knees to comb the sand. There was a little book I had, it's important. Peter cringed at the thought of following such a bungling leader on this risky mission. George had a towering ego and an off-putting habit of holding his index finger to his nose while talking, as if to prevent anyone else from getting a word in edgewise. Peter might have been amused if the situation were not so dire. They had come ashore less than an hour ago and had just finished unloading their deadly cargo when they experienced a terrifying close call. A tall figure striding toward them, swinging a flashlight. The beam illuminated the man's blue Coast Guard uniform. George gave a court wave of his hand, motioning for the others to stay back. Peter reached into a duffel bag and pulled out a red sweater, which he tossed to George, who slipped it over his wet fatigues. The other men snatched up the heavy crates and took cover while George went to intercept the guardsmen. The encounter had been tense, but mercifully brief. George was convinced the boy had believed his story, that they were fishermen who had lost their way. Peter was less sure. The fellow had fled quickly. Either he was frightened or he was planning to return with reinforcements, probably both. Peter squinted into the gray surf. The rubber dinghy and the sailors who had brought them here had been swallowed by darkness. His head shot up as an eerie mechanical hum cut through the fog. More trouble. Sub stuck, he noted deadpan. He pictured dozens of men desperately scrambling to raise the thousand ton sub out of the ocean silt. But fear for his own safety, safety surpassed any compassion he may have felt for the stranded crew. If they can't free themselves, Captain Linder has the orders to blow it up. George sounded like a spectator, betting on a boxing match, not a man on the ropes. Come on, Pete, let's scram. Peter trailed George up a slope toward the dunes. He had not walked more than a few feet or stood straight in weeks. His calves ached and his body rocked as if he were still on board the sub. They found the other men sitting on a large piece of driftwood, passing a bottle of schnapps between them. Both had changed into wrinkled civilian clothing and their discarded uniforms lay in a sodden heap beside a scattering of wooden crates. Both sprang to their feet as a searchlight began scanning the sand. The schnapps slipped from the smaller man's hand. The jigs up, he said. He had a cross-shaped scar in the center of his forehead that flashed in the darkness like a cyclops eye. Get a hold of yourself, the other man snapped. He stood to face George. This is all your fault. You should have killed that boy while you had the chance, or I would have done it for you. He was a heavy set fellow, and Peter had little trouble imagining him twisting the guardsman's neck and snapping it with his bare hands. Now, boys, George said evenly, this is the time to be quiet and hold your nerves. Do exactly what I tell you. Each of you get some crates and follow me. Pete, throw those uniforms in the duffel and come on. Peter curbed his worry by telling himself that at the very least, George was taking charge. Maybe the circumstances were not as dire, as hopeless as he feared. One look at the other men told him otherwise. The thick set oaf was halfway towards George and might have lunged if not for a flare that exploded overhead. The danger seemed to sober him for now. Swearing under his breath, he hefted a pair of crates onto his shoulders and started toward the dunes. The man with the scar hoisted another set and followed. When their backs were turned, Peter stuffed the wet uniforms into the duffel, strung the bag over his shoulder and picked up the remaining crate. The box held a sealed container to prevent water damage to the explosives inside and weighed close to 30 kilos. He had only taken a single step forward when the searchlight caught a glint of glass on the sand, the forgotten schnapps. The light seemed to linger on the label, Jad Stoltz, the Weimar ration brand. 
Disgusted that the others had left such an obvious trail, Peter stooped to pick it up. His fingers had just closed around the bottle's neck when he had another thought. Better to leave one small clue, a breadcrumb in the witch's forest, should things not go as planned. Peter lagged purposely behind as George led the others inland. When he had fallen a safe distance back, he dug a shallow, shallow hole and dropped his ship cap inside it. Another crumb and not much of a safeguard. If he was going to survive, he would have to find better means to protect himself. Peter dumped handfuls of sand over the cap, but could still see the insignia with its spread winged eagle and blood red swastika glimmering in the fog. Yikes. So, um, the next to last question is what are you working on next? Are you working on anything? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I also work as a book critic, so that's ongoing. Um, this Three Views is, um, took 10 years to write, but actually I had written several novels before that. So one of the novels that were unpublished. So I'm just cleaning up one of them and getting it ready to submit. And then I have a very big project that I'm not ready to really talk about. It's a surreal novel and I don't have a first draft, but I'm close to a complete first draft. Oh, that's great. Yeah. The answer is yes. But the amazing thing about this book is that people who have um, attachment to the story keep on reaching out to me. So for instance, the Coast Guard man who intercepted the men on the beach that night, his niece recently contacted me. I was contacted by the girlfriend, daughter of one of the saboteurs. The saboteur, the, the young man, Herbie Hout, was an American citizen. Um, he impregnated this woman fled to Mexico, fled to Germany, and was kind of coerced into returning to the United States to be part of this group. So um, this, this woman contacted me and her mother gave birth to one of the saboteur's children. So I wrote a, a follow-up. I also was contacted by um, the sons of the FBI man that interviewed one of the saboteurs. So I've been writing follow ups and it's just been all very, very interesting. Um, that wow. said, I'm also working on something else. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting. What, what you, what's wonderful, you're working on something else, but it's, it's interesting to it's, think, you know, when you when you publish a book, you say, oh, is anyone ever going to find this? Is anyone ever going to read mm -hmm. this? And then I, these people just, I guess found this it's thing. A, oh, it's amazing. And that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Oh, so my last question, which I will will uh, start here and um, go to the audience, is um, first of all, I have to thank you very much both thank for you. for being here. It's been fantastic. Um, the question is, why do we need historical fiction? We need historical fiction. What do you think? Um, so the <clears throat> easiest way for me to answer that is, I guess, <clears throat> talking about the Holocaust, I think that it's um, two things. The, event, the events of the Holocaust are too much for one person to take in. It, you can get all the statistics, but sometimes one person's story is more compelling than all the statistics in the world. So that <clears throat> was very, very important to me, telling it forward. My children are in the last generation of people who will have known survivors of the Holocaust. And I just feel it's incredibly important to tell it forward. That's one thing. And the, the real reason I feel that way is because we are experiencing dangerous levels of bigotry in America, and bigotry is really dangerous. I mean, I just, it leads to murder and um, genocide. And we are in a very, very serious moment in this country um, for people who come as refugees, African Americans, indigenous, Asian people. I mean, it, hate is really, really dangerous. So that's I felt that this story, even though it's a historical story, is quite relevant today. It is. Well, I agree 100%. Um, historical <laughs> fiction, I, you know, it's interesting because the story of the Nazi saboteurs had been treated as nonfiction um, and well done. I, I simply think that you reach a different audience you do. Um, than, you know, as a, a lover of historical fiction, as a reader, 
Um, I learn a tremendous amount. And, you know, you're really immersed in, in the world. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of historical fiction. Um, it, it just, it brings history to life for so many people. Well, I, I'd like to thank you both very, very much thank for, you, for coming here and, and participating in this today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Susan, if we could, should I open it up to the people in the room? <clears throat> so um, I will again extend my question, why, why do we need historical fiction? And then ask anything else you'd like. I hope, yes, please. I'm so comforted by hearing the process and how it comes to it. I, I recently just sold something that I've been working on almost nine and a half years, so I, I feel your pain and your agony. <laughs> I, I'd love to maybe ask the question of each of you in turn. You know, what, were there any particular sort of moments in your journey writing these, these two really special novels where you really felt almost like um, a dark night of the soul where, you know, I'm Put out my pen or shut off the word processor, or maybe I should just pivot and work on something easier. You know, what were those moments where were there any moments where you felt like, oh my gosh, I don't think this story is going to gel? Um, and how did you work through that? I in both instances, with both of these novels that I've written, I love the stories. What I did not know was whether I could do justice to the story. I know they're spectacular stories and just not well known, very interesting. I was fascinated. So I think you just have to trust yourself. I mean, if you are fascinated by it, it's, <clears throat> I call it kind of like I'm just cleaning out my house in the Murray, Murray condo kind of thing. If you love the sentence, <laughs> keep the sentence, if like you will embrace it and it's not doing anything for you, get rid of it, you know, and just trust the process. Uh, so I would have, and I, that's really wonderful and I'm really, I love that answer. Um, I would have reframed the question, were there any moments that were not dark nights of the soul? I mean, I got my first literary agent, I think in 2004. So it took me almost 20 years to get a novel published. Not for this novel, it was a different novel. Um, so I felt tremendous despair um, with the rejections. And I have been very public in talking about that because I think it's so common. I think every writer goes through it. So I had three literary <clears throat> agents for three different novels and they were never sold to publishers. So I felt a lot of despair until I finally reached some kind of um, understanding that rejection is actually the normal thing in this field mm -hmm. and that any acceptance is um, very rare and unusual. And so I, somebody said, you need to go for 100 rejections a year. And that was really helpful advice for me to realize you know, what the norm is. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think she's very right. I mean, I think that we have, you know, when you read about people in the arts, the, the person you see on the cover of People Magazine or Entertainment Weekly or something is the one superstar in that field. You don't see the 99.99% .99 other people struggling. So you say, that's the norm, you know, I'm going to be that writer. My career is going to be just like her, you know, and, and so, and the, unfortunately, it, it's good to have a reality check with, with gifted people, so. Well, I just finished uh, <clears throat> Stephanie's book, oh, and goodness. I have to say, well, look at Claude Monet, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're the career of the Impressionists, so, I mean, my goodness. They had an awful time. Yeah. They had a really it's awful time. Amazing. And I, I think I knew so many struggling artists who were just desperate, and, and then they couldn't pay their bills, and they couldn't support their kids, and whatever else, and that kind of my personal knowledge of, of of this particular type of drama and you feel like you're not good enough why aren't you good enough is you know went into that so that question or any others that we might have yes hi yeah, I, i'm wondering how do you find the time to write and what is your work process <clears throat> um somehow i I mean, I love to wake up and write. I have to force myself out, out the door to exercise. You know, I think, you know, you have to do other things and trust that even if you're not sitting in front of the computer, you're actually, you know, processing thoughts. Um, and it's healthy not always to sit there and it's healthy to walk away if you feel you're not making progress. That said, I mean, yes, I'm a fairly disciplined person. 
I think one has, one should have a routine and it should work for you. Um, and then you should be comfortable with it and you should be interested in what you're doing. And if you uh, feel on a day that you lack that interest, then, then that's the day you should take a walk and know that you are also doing work by taking that walk. But I mean, you know, I, people write in the morning, people write in the evening. For me, myself, I, I love nothing more than a cup of coffee and my computer. Mm, me too, me too. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so I started writing in earnest when I had a full time job and was raising kids so. Um, so it was a lot on the weekends, I was an early telecommuter and so I was telecommuting t Tuesdays and Fridays and I didn't schedule any work meetings on those mornings I really used them um, and later on as things. Um, well, the book criticism started to take off and then I started to feel like i'm on a t train wreck. Um, because I can't I have two full time jobs basically I'm writing every minute that I can and I'm also working every minute and I talked to um, the beloved David Cohen, who was the widower of Carla Cohen who founded politics and prose in um, Washington DC and I went out to lunch with him and he was a great social justice advocate and reader. I said, what should I do? And he said, cheat. <laughs> I said, well, I'm already cheating. And then I told this story. Um, when I was last in New York giving a talk, my old boss was in the audience. <laughs> so was like that, that was not a good thing to say. But I, I mean, I'm also a morning person, so now I, I write in the mornings. Yeah. I, I must share that I had, a, I had a, of course, you know, I made money writing, but it wasn't a living, of course. <laughs> uh, who, maybe somebody does somewhere, but but anyway. So I had, a, I had a wonderful office job, and they all knew about my writing. They were terribly proud of me, and it was just the most wonderful situation. And one day, all of a sudden, all the computers went down, and the the the, the I think he was one of the heads of HR or something. He was a friend of mine. Came running towards me and said, "You didn't lose any of your writing, did you?" <laughs> And my sister called me up and said, keep that job. <laughs> Boring, but it was, I mean, I, I should dedicate something in all my books to, to the wonderful uh, support of, of, of my day job. It's just amazing. Um, does anybody else want to ask a question? Do we have any questions? We don't. We have a Wait, silent. Uh... I, think, I think there's a question. Oh, my goodness. Hi. Thank you. This is my friend Kathy Summer, who's a really wonderful songwriter, musician, got me through my music theory classes in freshman and sophomore year, so thank you. Um, I'm really interested in trauma, and I, I think that was actually the title of this, um, the trauma of World War II is of this gathering. Um, my interest in trauma is that I think as a, in America, as a society, we don't understand the least bit about it. Um, you know, I always give the example of like 30 kids are murdered in Uvalde and we'll bring in the grief counselors and get closure and I'm, no, that's not the way it works. And a trauma of the level that, uh, particularly that John experienced where your entire extended family is murdered, um, you cannot get over that, you cannot have closure. And I, I wouldn't say I'm a mission driven writer, but I also really care that we as a society understand who are these refugees coming to our shores? They didn't choose to come here. They don't want to be here. They yeah. came because of massive trauma. And you can manage it, but you can never get over it. And I was really interested, particularly in one um, survivor that I knew very, very well. And he, he was like Yanko. He landed on his feet, had a beautiful family, successful career. You can have all the gifts that the United States can give you, but you're still you can't get closure on it. and I think we would it would behoove us as a society to understand that in more complexity. Um, so that's, I guess, the best answer I can give. Thank you. It's a wonderful answer, actually. Thank you. 
So does anybody else want to um, say anything or ask any questions or, you know, you'll think about them when you go home, I always do. I never can think about anything when I go to these talks, you know, and then I say, I should have said, you know, but I don't. <laughs> so we have no more questions, huh? Well, in that case, You've been a great audience. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to our, our writers. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope those of you who are, in, are those of you who are know this place will will come again. And and uh, those of you who are new here, uh, we'll come back because we have some wonderful times here, and we are we write some really interesting things, all quite quite different. It's really quite an interesting bunch of people. Thank you. So have a good evening. And that concludes our program. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. You can find out more about the New York City chapter of the Historical Novel Society and our leadership at our website or contact us at hns-nyc at mail.com. And finally, please consider supporting our volunteer panelists and hosts. You can contact them at their websites below. Thanks for joining us.